Folks, it's Healthcare Unfiltered, and we have a recurring guest. Always fun to have the master of urothelial cancer and GU oncology, Dr. Petros Grievous on Healthcare Unfiltered. Petros, welcome to the show. Fantastic to be here and uh, always a pleasure to discuss with you, Tadi. You're doing a great job serving educational mission. Great to interact with you and uh, looking forward to the wonderful discussion. Thanks, brother. And I know that you are traveling. You are in some fun weekend. Your Amigos Life, uh, our colleagues in Your Amigos did a fantastic job this weekend where we are taping on Sunday after you landed. The rumor has it you won some cup or something. What's what's up with that? You are up to date with all the rumors, uh, Chadi, as always. You're on top of the news. So the Euro Migos, uh, it's a fantastic forum. Uh, Brian Rini and Tom Powell's have created this amazing podcast, highly recommended, as you said, for everybody to listen, related to GU cancers and discussing, you know, new data, dissecting the mechanisms and the applications. And they had the second in-person meeting happening in Nashville. This took place uh, this last few days, uh, November 2 to November 4. It was so much fun. We discussed data covering kidney cancer, prostate cancer, and urothelial carcinoma in detail. There was no like the classical lecture presentation. So what cu- what cup did you win? What what like what what is that? I I I, I was trying to get, put it in context, but one of the of the great fun events of this meeting again, trying to educate the uh, the crowd uh, based on the data was the Euromigos cap. So this was kind of a medical jeopardy format, you know, back in the day with a medical jeopardy in TV, uh, uh, you know, the jeopardy game similar. So it was a medical knowledge competition. There were four teams. There were two semifinals and the final game. I was honored to be part of the Team LA, Los Angeles. Uh, the captain was Dr. Tanya Dorf uh, and Dr. Monty Powell, uh, was my, my uh, they were two of my comrades there. And uh, we uh, played the semifinal uh, against a fantastic team, Team Boston. Oh, Team uh, Boston, and- that sweary guy, he can he doesn't know anything. <laughs> you know, I, I have to give them credit. They were great. They did a fantastic job and uh, they tried. But uh, they tried. Think... That's the key. They tried. <laughs> <laughs> but the the team LA won the semifinal, and the final game uh, was uh, against in Cleveland. And you know, people argued. You know, I, I spent four years in Cleveland. How come I end up in Team LA? So there was a, this debate there. But uh, I I I was honored to join Team LA, and we won the Euromigos Cup. It was a fantastic event. I can I cannot tell you how fun it was. Petros, uh, what do you say to people who are saying that? This is the only cup that Greece could ever win. Like they keep people are saying like Greece can never win a World Cup. This is the closest Greece will ever get to a World Cup. Defend Greece. (laughs) I have to share with you videos back in uh, 2004 when Greece won the European Championship in soccer. I was still finishing medical school at the time and they won Portugal at the at the final game. It was one of the first times Ronaldo played with Portugal. The whole country was like literally celebrating for weeks. I, I cannot even describe to you how fun it was. Uh, in, in basketball, though, we came very close, 2006. Uh, Greece, uh, actually, it was very surprising. They beat the United States, a dream team, in the semifinal, but they lost to Spain in the final game. Actually, I remember this, and I remember I was really cheering for Greece against Portugal, partly because despite the fact that the Greece continued to sabotage the Baklava origin, (laughs) uh, I was actually rooting for them uh, against Ronaldo. And um, But uh, hopefully, hey, Euro Cup is next year, so I don't know if Greece qualified or not. You know, I, I, I have to check on that. I, I have to check on that, yeah. We we need to watch the games together at some point. And yes. I have to invite you to Seattle, my friend, because uh, the next World Cup is in the United States. And uh, Seattle is one of the cities that will host the World Cup uh, games for the soccer. Uh, I'm uh, expecting tickets. I'm expecting tickets, so don't disappoint me. We have to do a podcast here in situ, outside yes. the <laughs> soccer stadium. <laughs> uh, speaking of Europe, we both were at the ESMO meeting. I mean, the ESMO meeting, the European Society of Medical Oncology, which was held in Madrid just a few weeks ago, um, was always exciting. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. But I have to say that I was uh, blown away by the data that was presented on urothelial cancer. And that's really the topic of today's podcast, because 
um, you know, it's not that common that uh, speakers um, get a standing ovation and uh, people are clapping. And uh, it was certainly there's a lot of data that actually was presented. So I, I appreciate the fact that you came in to help us understand what in the world just happened at ESMO in neurothelial cancer. So I want to start by talking about, um, you know, early stage disease. Is there anything in early stage disease that was presented at ESMO that uh, would make you do things differently? And we're talking, these are patients who uh, do not have metastatic disease. Tadi, first of all, you're always, as I say, you know, on top of the data, it's impressive how you keep track across tumor types. You're correct. You know, what we experienced in Madrid, it was phenomenal. It was, I think, personally speaking, one of the best meetings I have ever attended, uh, ESMO uh, meeting uh, specifically. And uh, it was so much fun to see the impressive data sets. And I can share with you, as a member of the scientific uh, committee for GU non-prostate uh, group track, it was so hard to rank the abstracts and you know create the program because of the plethora of high quality content and really really you know transformative data sets that we saw so uh, we'll start um with uh, data in non muscle invasive disease, I will say that uh, uh, in that space, it's specifically BCG unresponsive or BCG experienced or exposed non muscle invasive bladder cancer, let's call it NMIBC for this podcast. The overall, uh, just the initial statement, there was nothing immediately practice changing. So, nothing that the urologists need to know right away for their practice today. However, there was significant progress in the field study, and I'm very optimistic about the future. Why is that? We saw data with this so-called pretzel, which is this device that uh, is being administered, delivered intravesically by our great friends and colleagues in urology. This is delivered once every three weeks. And this uh, uh, kind of device is unfolding inside the bladder and forming this pretzel um, uh, formation and is delivering in a sustainable manner gemcitabine, the classical chemotherapeutic, that actually has data as an intravesical solution administration, but, uh, but this is a different administration uh, uh, device, right? So that data was presented by Dr. Andrea Necki from Italy. This was the second data set from Sunrise One. Dr. Sia Danesman saw the Sunrise One initial data with this pretzel at AUA in April in Chicago. So this was the second uh, time we saw data. And I will focus specifically on the TAR-200. That's the name of the device, the pretzel administering gypsarabine. Uh, and that pretzel by itself, monotherapy, uh, it produced an impressive clinical complete response rate or 77% by central assessment. Uh, and this, of course, it was in a small sample size, only 30 patients. So definitely this required larger sample size and longer follow-up. It's not ready for prime time, but definitely set the stage that this pretzel device, it's a great platform to deliver gemcitabine in this context of TAR-200 and potentially other agents. For example, we saw a separate study by Dr. Villaseca in Spain with very early data with TAR-210, 210. And that is a similar, uh, the same device, a pretzel as we call it, but it's not coated with gemcitabine, but instead the TAR-210 with erdafitinib, the FGFR inhibitor. Oh, wow, erdafitinib is uh, intravesical, huh? Very interesting, right? Uh, I did not see is... that, wow. Yeah, this was a uh, very early data, only 11 patients. Uh, you can argue small sample size, but nine out of 11 had a, a clinical complete response. So very promising. So I see in the future, uh, we're waiting for more data for the TAR-200 and TAR-210. Not ready yet for prime time, as I mentioned, but uh, the Sunrise program with the TAR-200, the gemcitabine uh, pretzel, has four clinical trials. We just talked about Sunrise 1. We're going to see more data. This BCG are responsive NMIBC. Sunrise 2 is mass invasive bladder cancer and is the pretzel TAR-200 with cetrelimab, a checkpoint inhibitor, versus chemoradiation for bladder preservation uh, for mass invasive disease. Sunrise 3 is BCG-naive NMIBC. We're going to see data there in the future with the TAR-200 with or without the checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, and this is a BCG-naive space 
So BCG is standard of care there. And Sarah is four. We're going to open it very soon at our center with Dr. Sarah Sutka from urology is in cisplatin ineligible patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. We're going to evaluate the TAR200 with a checkpoint inhibitor as a new adjuvant strategy. So the, the Sunrise program for trials, very promising for the future. And the TAR210, we wait for more data for the uh, device with erdafitinib. But all of the Sunrise program uh, trials include intravesical therapy using that device. That's exactly all, right. All it's, of uh, them. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I guess what, one of the trials you commented on, Petrus, was the one in muscle invasive bladder cancer. And it's not like in our minds as medical oncologists, we don't think of intravesical therapy to treat muscle invasive disease. We think of some form of surgical intervention. So how how would you, is it just you, is it just for, for folks who cannot undergo surgery or is it... Um, how would you do the intravesical and muscle invasive? The classic teaching for listeners is muscle invasive disease. If you can do surgery, do surgery. And some people might not be able to have surgery, so you do chemo RT. Great question, Sadi, as always. So the idea behind that program, especially Sunrise 2 and Sunrise 4, we are, which are focusing on muscle invasive bladder cancer, is to combine this TAR200 device, the pretzel coated with gemcitabine to uh, try to eradicate cancer cells in the bladder wall uh, in the context of the bladder tumor located in the bladder with a checkpoint inhibitor is supposed to try to go after any potential systemic micrometastasis. I see. And I think the, the, the key point that you're implying, which is very important for patients who are fit for cisplatin, we should and we must, I would say, offer cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy before radical cystectomy and lymphoma dissection in those who can tolerate cisplatin because there is significant underutilization of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in fit patients in bladder cancer with muscle invasive. So that's important to note. And the main reason we do that is to try to eradicate micrometastasis. So in similar context here, if you have patients who go bladder preservation, uh, traditionally those patients get a maximum TURBT and then they go for concurrent chemo radiation and that's a control group for the Sunrise 2. And the question is whether the TAR200 device and the checkpoint inhibitor can potentially produce similar results of uh, long-term event-free survival with bladder intact. Uh, that's a great question for the Sunrise 2 trial. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so this is for non-muscle invasive disease, although you we commented on a couple of studies that will include muscle invasive disease, but we started talking about the device because the data that was presented at uh, ESMO was really in non-muscle invasive. So moving now to muscle invasive disease, the classic, uh, you know, the way at least I think of muscle invasive disease is, you know, early stage, um, you know, where you are going to potentially... Um, could offer surgery, and there are always early stage disease that uh, you st- cannot offer surgery because comorbidities, age, or a variety of, of reasons. How? What, what's? What, what did you see at ESMO that was uh, uh, intriguing to you? So, so first of all, I, I think it's a very important point you're raising, Sad, is patients who are not eligible for radical cystectomy, frequently they're going for blood preservation, with maximum TURBT and uh, concurrent chemo radiation. However, there are actually is increasing patient population who may still be fit for radical cystectomy, but select, opt to undergo bladder preservation. And, and that's, uh, I think, a very reasonable approach for a significant proportion of patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. So uh, I we I can tell you that uh, we have this multidisciplinary bladder cancer clinic at the University of Washington and Fred Hatz, and we have urology, medonc, and radonc, along with pathology and radiology. And we review those cases. We do it every Tuesday morning. We have four new patients. You know, we, we review in detail the nuances, patient characteristics, medical comorbidities, performance status, tumor characteristics, tumor histology, location, uh, uh, where exactly is in the bladder, extent of disease, focality versus multifocality, and disease outside the bladder, and of course, you know, um, uh, other nuances, and that we have the pathology and radiology looking at the scans and the slides. And in, in that way, we actually have published 
that have been changing the management in about 60% of the patients, three out of five patients, leave that clinic with a different plan when uh, compared to when they came in. And some of those patients actually go for bladder preservation as a very acceptable way uh, to, to treat and try, attempt to cure the disease. Obviously, there are some characteristics that may be associated with better or less good prognosis with that approach. Uh, so we try to implement patient selection to the best of our knowledge, and of course, taking into account multiple characteristics. Now, um, uh, and that's, I think, is a, it's a great message to the community out there that blood preservation should be considered, uh, you know, especially in select patients and should be discussed, ideally in the context of multidisciplinary clinic, if that's available, of course, which is, we understand it's not always available, but it's ideal. Now, the the question you posed were any data at, at uh, ESMO, right, that they were relevant to clinical practice. I don't think there was anything really, really practice transformative or changing for muscle invasive localized disease. However, we saw some interesting data I want to share with you. For example, Dr. Kala Sridhar from Toronto, Princess Margaret, saw some very interesting data with a pet news study. Uh, this was a study trying to evaluate whether there is any role of pet CT, FDG, pet CT uh, in patients with localized uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer and uh, whether we should do it routinely. And, and the short answer, um, the highlight was that there is no routine role of FDG PET. Usually the CAT scan with IV contrast or chest, abdomen, and pelvis or MRIs when needed uh, usually uh, are adequate for management of those patients. Of course, there are specific patient scenarios, maybe some borderline lymph nodes. You want to take a better look with a PET if they light up, neuroendocrine bladder cancer. There are specific scenarios uh, that PET may be useful, but for the majority of patients, uh, a PET scan, FDG has no proven role uh, and uh, it's not usually used. And PET MUSE trial pretty much showed that there was no significant difference in the management with or without the PET. Um, and the, about, if I remember correctly, about 60% of patients, uh, 60, 60, so three out of five patients, had uh, received new adjuvant chemotherapy. And this was comparable in the PET and the no PET group. So again, no no major differences. Of course, we can we can visualize scenarios where we may use a PET very very selectively and not routinely. Another interesting study again by Dr. Sridhar in Toronto. Uh, it was the cohort L um, uh, that was actually part of the EV103 study, new adjuvant and fortmovedotin followed by radical cystectomy, left no dissection, and then adjuvant form of a dotting. Um, the pathologic complete response in that study was in the neighborhood of 35%, similar to what we saw with the cohort H of that EV103. Uh, so not surprising, and this is in splatted ineligible unfit patients, about a third of them had pathologic CR with EV alone. This is not practice changing, but I think sets the stage and gives you know some light to two ongoing phase three trials, Keynote B15, cisplatin eligible patients, Pembro EV versus GEMCIS as neoadjuvant therapy, and you have Pembro EV component in the adjuvant phase, and the Keynote 905, which evaluates Pembro EV in cisplatin ineligible patients. So those two trials, Keynote B15, Keynote 905, are still ongoing, very promising. They are going to uh, result in the future, and I think there might be practice changing, but of course, we have to see that those data sets. We do, and uh, judging from the metastatic disease data, I mean, who knows, probably they might actually end up being uh, practice changing, like you said. But I think it's fair to say, Petros, that's probably the bulk of the um, gasps and the aha moments came in in the metastatic disease for urothelial cancer. Um I mean, I don't know where we start from, but I recall uh, a couple of years ago, you know, your highness, your highness changed our practice uh, because uh, for folks who are listening, we've always used chemotherapy and uh, your data that you collaborate with, with Tom and, and others showed that adding maintenance avilumab does actually improve outcomes for patients and pretty much, you know, everybody, uh, believe that this is practice changing and that paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So take us from there, take us, you know, take us from like a few years back when you presented that data that was amazing data was practice changing transformative and how we got here 
uh, for, for listeners, because there are many folks that would argue today that the data that was presented three years ago is no longer relevant. Tariq, really, really a great <laughs> framework. Uh, you, you phrased it, I think, uh, well. Uh, so it's a journey, right? It's definitely a journey. And uh, I will start by about three and a half years ago. Uh, and I can tell you uh, when uh, it, uh, we had this tragedy of the pandemic, right? Uh, one of the uh, highlights during that time was the uh, reporting of the results of the practice changing phase three clinical trial called Javelin Bladder 100. And as you said, this was a practice changing study looking at the role of switch maintenance avelumab, an anti-PDL1 checkpoint inhibitor that became the standard of care for patients who had a response, CR or PR, or stable disease, meaning no progression after platinum-based chemotherapy. gem or GEM-carbo, uh, four, five, or six cycles were given. Those patients who did not have progression went ahead with uh, available maintenance, and this prolonged significantly overall survival compared to best supportive care alone. So the, the, the practice change was to use Avelumab as a switch maintenance strategy in the first line setting, rather than watch and wait uh, until patient has progression. This overall survival benefit was significant. Uh, I, these patients uh, who got Avelumab uh, maintenance, starting from the uh, randomization time, the median overall survival was about two years in the Avelumab group. And this was sig uh, sig statistically significant. Has a ratio in the initial report was 0.69, with longer follow-up and more patients getting salvage therapy in the control was 0 0.76, but definitely uh, significant statistically and clinically. So this changed practice uh, in the U.S. and about 65 countries or so. So available maintenance has been a sign of care. And now, uh, over the last three years, what happened until we came to ESMO 2023? We saw three large phase three trials in the frontline setting of metastatic urothelial carcinoma, namely Keynote 361, Invigor 130, and Danube trials that completed, resulted, and did not change practice. Very briefly, Keynote 361, chemo Pembro versus chemotherapy or Pembro alone. Invigor 130, chemo Atizo, Atizo alone and chemo placebo, and then Danube trial, it was Durvatremi, uh, it was antipetyl one plus ETLA4 versus chemotherapy, gem or gem carbo. Neither of those three trials changed practice. And the notion has been that the concurrent administration of chemo plus checkpoint inhibitor does not move the needle forward, but the sequential approach with the javelin blood. Which was a bit strange. Like, it was, I have to say, like, this is, what you just summarized, it's really why we do clinical trials, right? Because I think, you know, when you see your data uh, that you, with Avilumab, you know, you would think that adding adding it early on might actually have better outcomes. You know, it, it, not, not to compare diseases, but there's actual data in non-small cell lung cancer where the uh, you do the immunotherapy closer to chemo RT in locally advanced disease, you actually have improvement in outcomes versus later on. And in fact, there's an there's a trial that is ongoing right now, adding based on that the immunotherapy to the chemotherapy and RT early on. It's, it's just fascinating to me. I would have predicted the opposite, but like you said, basically sequential better than concurrent. Great point, Sadi. And, you know, when Tom Powell and me were discussing about this years ago, nobody would predict, right, that the concurrent wouldn't work, but the sequential would work. So it was for, for all of us in that trial, there were many people involved. Tom presented the data at the ASCO plenary session in 2020. This was published, as you said, in the English Journal of Medicine in September 2020. And all, all of us who were part of the study were, were positively impressed. Now, it was interesting to why this happened, why the concurrent chemo IO administration did not pan out at the time. And there was some suggestion of uh, data by Matt Galski and others that cisplatin might be a better partner uh, with checkpoint inhibition rather than carboplatin. This came based on some preclinical data uh, in the lab and maybe some signals in those studies in Vigor 130 and Kino 361, that if you tease out the cisplatin plus IO 
might potentially, you see, a, a marginal benefit, a modest benefit. Uh, and this may not be the case with carboplast IO in urothelial cancer, first line. Now, that, that question uh, was asked in the Checkmate 901 trial that they uh, took only cisplatin-eligible patients and they randomized the patients to gemcis nevo versus gemcis and that trial did not have carboplatin, right? So those patients, um, uh, as I mentioned, were randomized in that way. And at the time the trial was designed, there was no maintenance available in the picture because it was designed before 2020. Now, when Michael van der Heyden did a fantastic job presenting the data at ESMO just a few weeks ago, he showed that about 20% of patients in the control chemotherapy arm received maintenance of LMAP. You can argue it's a kind of relatively low proportion, so the control arm was not optimal. Uh, but that study, uh, for whatever it's worth, it was a positive trial that statistically uh, uh, there was a difference in, in favor of GEMSIS NIVO over GEMSIS. There was an overall survival benefit hazard ratio, 0.78. Uh, and there was, a, I would say, an, an increase in the response rate. Uh, the response rate with the GEMSIS NIVO was in the around 57% or so and was about 43% uh, with GEMSIS alone. Uh, so some numerical difference. Uh, you can argue not dramatic increase in response rate, but increase. If you go to a nuance point, the response rate with GEMSIS alone in that trial, Checkmate 101, was slightly numerically lower compared to what we saw in GEMSIS at ISO, 47%, and in the GEMSIS alone in the in, in the in Vigor 130 trial, and with GEMSIS alone in the Kino 361 trial. So in the neighborhood, though, the response with GEMSIS was in, in the neighborhood of what you would expect, 43 to 50%. Uh, and I refer just only the control arms of the three trials, right? The 901, 361, 130. Having said that, I, I think that this data um, is practice changing, uh, especially in countries which have no access to PEMBRO EV. And we'll talk about PEMBRO EV in a second. But the bottom line is there was overall survival benefit. The patients who had the complete response with GEMSIS NIVO, uh, this subset of patients, uh, I think it was 22% with a, a complete response GEMSIS NIVO, the median duration of response was about 37 months. So durable responses, I think, representing the effect of nivolumab. And there was some tail in the curve in the GEMSIS NIVO data. So the, practically the, the, speaking. The, yeah. I mean, the thing is with the gem cis nevo data, and I'm curious your thoughts. First of all, I did feel bad for the author who presented after Tom at that session. I mean, it was really tough to do. <laughs> so, but, very hard job. Very, very hard, <laughs> very hard job. job. But uh, but nonetheless, a couple of things for this study that I, I, I struggled with, and I'm curious your thoughts. Um, the gem cis, I mean, the cis versus carboplatin uh, nuance point that you bring up is really important because it seems like cis is more effective than carboplatin. I mean, it just, it seems like it. But in the gem cis nebo, um, you said there's 20% of folks who received uh, maintenance avilumab in the gem cis only arm. It's hard not to ask the question, should, if more patients received maintenance avilumab, on the GEMSIS control arm, would that nullify the overall survival benefit? I don't think we know the answer to that, but it's a, it's a logical question to ask. And then the second question that, that I'm curious your thoughts about, uh, many folks would contend, well, GEMSIS NEVO is better than GEMSIS, but if you do GEMSIS NEVO versus GEMSIS followed by NEVO, probably you will get the same. In other words, like, you know, almost duplicating your study but putting NIVO as maintenance versus combination. I don't know. I mean, are, are these logical questions you think to ask? Absolutely. These are fantastic questions. And, and I think, you know, it's extremely hard to answer if the OS benefit that we saw in the segment and one came because of the maintenance components, like the maintenance nivolumab, as we saw with the maintenance of Velumab in Javelin Bladder 100, it's a very possible uh, assumption it's impossible to answer it because, as you pointed out, only 20% of patients in the control, GEMSIS arm, got maintenance available. If that 20% was 60%, someone may argue this may have been a negative trial. It's possible. Uh, and I think this is a logical assumption. We'll never find out because, to your point, it, it, it's, it was not designed to, to answer this question. It was always hard to compare apples to oranges. Now, someone in the clinic, again, let's assume PEMBRO-EV is not accessible in a country X, right? US, 
you know, it will be accessible, but in countries with different healthcare systems, Pembroke V may be expensive and not reimbursed, uh, and which brings another whole point of access to care and global uh, equity of care, but that's a different discussion. But let's say in that country X, Pembroke V is out, and then you have GEMS is an eligible patient, GEMS is NIVO, or you do GEMS is followed by Velma. I think either approach is reasonable. There are pros and cons in either approach. If you think about toxicity and cost, you may potentially go with the available approach. Having said that, many patients may want to get the IO up front. Uh, the attractive points of that is, again, the high response rates, um, you know, from 43% to about 57% or so, 22% CR rate, and these durable responses. Uh, and you the primary progression rates on the GEMSIS NIVO was less than 10%. Obviously, you have to have a second scan without progression to get to the maintenance phase. Uh, so very nuanced difference there, but uh, it's hard to answer it. So I think there are pros and cons. Probably I would ex I would imagine that people may want to get the IO up front just in the notion of trying to get more patients responding or at least not progressing and having less attrition because the the avirumab data was mainly in patients without progression so i can see the value if you're having higher response rate uh, with gemsis nevo then you'll probably do gemsis nevo and then after you finish gemsis nevo do you continue nevo i think it's a, it's reasonable again it's it's hard to tease out you know it's hard to tease out yeah how to how the concurrent new administration contributed here some people believe strongly did some others question it i think at the end of the day as you pointed out may it, it you know the patient may may opt to get it yeah. up front yeah. uh i think the, the toxicity question is relevant there was slightly more toxicity with uh uh Niva, as you can imagine you put immunotherapy up front you add some more IRAEs. Yeah. i think if you have a response to stable disease uh, to Jameson's Nevo, then you continue Nevo, and the design was up to two years unless there was progression or major toxicity. Yeah. And, and we'll go through a scenario of a patient that comes into your clinic towards the end of the podcast because it's it's really, it's, it, it's uh, uh, I mean, gosh, like 20 years ago, probably the conversation would have been just five minutes, and, and right now, here it is. So um, that is one part of data, but then Take us through the the other part of the other study that really uh, captured a lot of attention was featured on CNN and and, and, and other other uh, news outlets. Absolutely, I, I can tell you this was one of the thrilling moments in your career where you you feel the goosebumps because you see ten or twenty thousand of people, you know, whoever was in the room stood up and cheering. And, and, and celebrating. I was there. I did stand up. Yeah, amazing, right? Did you you filled it, right, yeah. Sandy? It I, I actually put a clip on Twitter because it was really, um, it was it was really amazing. I mean, I the the one the last other time that I witnessed standing ovation was probably when adjuvant Herceptin in in breast cancer actually took place over. I mean, it was really amazing. So t take us through that in terms of the trial what it showed and what, what it felt like to be um, to be in the audience listening and part of this. Absolutely. And I think to your point, Sadi, I think maybe the TDXD data uh, a couple of years ago at ASCO also had a really impressive uh, ovation. I think overall, uh, there was an appetite in the, you know, for everybody to try to develop a regimen that can quote unquote beat you know, uh, chemotherapy, platinum-based chemotherapy, specifically in the frontline setting of advanced urothelial carcinoma. So the data with pembrolizumab plus and fortumab, and for the audience, pembro is anti-PD-1, and fortumab adotin is an antibody drug conjugate, ADC, against nectin-4, a, a, a protein that is expressed significantly in urothelial carcinoma cells, linked with a very potent linker with MMAE, a, a disruptor of microtubules, a very potent uh, microtubule disruptor that then, you know, results in cell killing. And you cannot give MMAE by itself. It's extremely toxic, right? But you have to package it in a, in, in a way that I, I go to Greek uh, mythology and, and the Trojan War. It's like a Trojan horse study, right? Uh, back in, in And uh, this is the, the way you deliver package the, this uh, potent toxin to the cancer cells. Is not perfectly selective because nectin-4 can be expressed in the skin. We can talk about toxicity in a second, but 
This this trial was designed as a phase three, uh, Pembroke versus Gemsys or Gem Carbo. Uh, the, the data was that supported that phase three uh, were coming from a phase one B slash two trial called V103, uh, cohort A and cohort K, that Pembroke plus and Fortumab generated a very impressive uh, overall response rate uh, uh, between 65 and 73 percent, on average 68 percent. Uh, and that actually resulted in a, an accelerated approval by the FDA in April of 2023, just about six months ago, in cisplatin ineligible, unfit for cisplatin patients with advanced urothelial cancer that were naive uh, for treatment for advanced disease. So the trial, the phase three trial was designed before the maintenance available data came out. So the control group was designed with chemo alone without maintenance. And when the Tom presented the data at ASCO 2020 with double platinum 100, many of us raised the flag and say, hey, please amend that uh, uh, trial if possible. We want to have an optimal control arm uh, with chemotherapy. A lot of discussion that that control arm was amended later and may, the, may, the amendment was mainly to uh, account how to deal with the censoring issue in the control arm. For example, before the amendment, if I understand this correctly, uh, they, patients who got available maintenance were censored for progression. Uh, and after the amendment, um, uh, this changed. So that was the main change. Having said that, about 30% of patients, one third, got maintenance available in the control group. In theory, yes, I would like that to be higher in an ideal world. I would like it to be more than that. But Petros, the, to, you, to, you, to, you guys, to your guys' credit, when the data of Avilumab came about, you did go ahead and amend the protocol. I mean, you can't do anything about patients who've already been enrolled and they completed therapy, but you amended the protocol and one third to 40, 30 to 40 percent of folks did receive Avilumab after the amendment. I mean, what else could you do? Yeah, and I think and, and 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 I give credit to the investigators. I was not part of the V three hundred two, but but I commend them that, as you said, the protocol was amended. Uh, I think it's a good thing. And and if you ask me, is thirty percent of patient, patients getting maintenance available acceptable? I think overall I would like it higher, but I think it's acceptable because the real world update of available maintenance was not as high as expected, maybe between 50-55%. Having said that, I think the degree of benefit we, we'll talk about in a second, I think accounts for that. And I think it's such a big difference than I think if Pembro is a standard of care. Uh, the other, so the other I, thing, and not to interrupt you, the other thing is your data shows that if you give patients who have had no progression, so stable disease, PR and CR, avilumab, you have improvement in survival. So when we say 30%, we basically have to look at patients who had a stable disease or response. So artificially, it could actually represent a higher percentage. It's 30% of the entire control arm. But I think we have to look at who had stable disease, PR and CR in the control arm, and you should look at the percent of these patients who received maintenance avilumab. It's probably more than 30% because you have to select those without progression. Great point, Sadi. And I think, again, based on the real world data we're getting from Flatiron and other, other data sets, I think that 30% is probably higher to what I had expected. Uh, and I think it's, again, it's not perfect, but I think it's an acceptable sure. um, uh, situation. Uh, having said that, you know, and another detail, again, it does not take away uh, from the standing ovation, but there was almost very limited to none access to Enfortumab in the control group. Uh, this may have affected the, the hazard ratio, right? If you if you have access to Enfortumab in the control group, the hazard ratio may have been less dramatic. Again, this doesn't take away the practice changing nature of the study, but it's something to discuss in an academic setting and in, the, in those trials. Uh, no, without these uh, things in mind, uh, the uh, Pembro and Fortumab combination resulted in the uh, dramatic improvement in PFS. Uh, there was a doubling of median PFS for about six months to 12.5 months, uh, hazard ratio 0.45 uh, with uh, Pembro EV. And the overall survival that was a standing ovation moment has a ratio 0.47 with a doubling of the median overall survival from what we called it for decades, about 16 months to 31.5 months. So this doubling of median OS, the tail of the curve that was, I think, impressive with a caveat of a short follow-up, only median follow-up was median 17 months. That's another little kind of uh, detail. We need longer follow-up. Having said that, this 
with these caveats in mind, the data overall were substantially impressive and transformative for the field. You, you'd you almost, uh, uh, you know, never see uh, a doubling of Midian OS uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a solid tumor study uh, and uh, that impressive difference on the, uh, on the two uh, couple of major curves and also the grade three or higher treatment related adverse events uh, were lower in the in the experimental group. Pembro EV was 56% and it was approaching 70% with chemotherapy. Having said that, we can discuss a little bit if you wish uh, study about toxicity because I think it's very important yes. to have an optimal education for community and academic oncologists how to, to optimize the delivery of EV Pembro. Yes, I'd love to talk about that. And, and I think that... Um... Look, I mean, there will never, ever be a perfect clinical trial. You can always poke holes in every trial. But what I saw in a disease that is lethal, like urothelial and bladder cancer, is something, honestly, I never thought I'd see. It's very difficult to imagine that um, this data is not uh, powerful. But take us through the toxicities that you mentioned and uh, the, the optimal delivery of treatment. I, I totally agree, Charlie. This is transformative data that, you know, it's rare to see and definitely justifying the study innovation and a uh, great job by Tom Powell's giving a fantastic presentation. Uh, and I think great job by Dr. Michael van der Heiden, who did the segment and one right after. I, <laughs> I, know, was I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to, as we mentioned, impressive OS data, impressive PFS data, no doubt about it. And someone, I think, put it like a track in between the curves in Twitter, and that's to show the <laughs> difference in the Kaplan Mayer curves, literally track. Uh, the other impressive point was the response rate that was 68% yeah. with pembrolizumab and fortumab, exactly what we saw in the phase one B and two trial. And this is interesting because usually you see lowering of the response rate mm -hmm. as you go from phase one to phase three. Here it stays the same, just shows the robustness of this regimen. And I see some synergies between the two agents. The other thing is the durability of response. A really impressive. Uh, many patients who respond have durable responses. Now, the question is, uh, to your point, how to optimize the experience for the patients and the provider for EV Pembro. And the toxicity data are very important to tease out. Uh, as you, as I mentioned, fifty six percent of patients, about half of them, had a grade three or higher treatment related adverse events. The treatment related toxicity deaths were very uh, low, were rare. It was less than one percent. It was zero point nine percent in each group. Uh, and uh, grade three, four adverse events, peripheral neuropathy is something that I think requires significant attention with EV. Uh, about half of the patients had neuropathy on the study. And neuropathy can be tricky. It's significantly underreported by patients, underrecognized by providers. It's hard to quantify, hard to assess. I think we need to be more and more vigilant about neuropathy. Examine the patient at baseline and serially. This takes time in a very busy clinic, as we all know, when we run around to see patients in a, in a packed day. But we need to take time to examine the patient, ask them about neuropathy symptoms, if they have trouble grabbing items. I always make the Greek joke, do you break plates by, you know, not in the, you know, the old, in, in Greek parties in the 60s, they were breaking plates. But now, you know, joke aside to make sure patients do not have trouble, you know, uh, grabbing an object, buttoning buttons or tying the shoelaces or what I call taking a sour test. If you go to the sour uh, and do you need to hold into something to avoid falling? So these are important questions to ask to the patient. And I always, especially after the first or second cycle of EV, depending on toxicity, I actively look for a reason to dose reduce. Uh, because I think inevitably th those reduction is needed. Sometimes therapy holds are needed. So extra attention to neuropathy. Skin rash is another very important component. 50 to 60% of patients may have skin rash. It's mostly grade one, grade two. But as we saw in the data from the trials, Stephen Johnson is rare, but needs to be th thought of and considered. And a very good example of the patient remove the clothes, do a good physical exam. Patients may have to report sometimes because they want to stay on life-prolonging therapy. Sure, sure. Uh, so very uh, extra attention there, scratching, eating, pruritus, appetite issues, taste changes, fatigue, 
uh, constipation, nausea, diarrhea, uh, things to uh, sometimes low blood counts. All of those things need to be discussed with the patient. Those adjustments will be needed. Education and experience will help because I like everything. Right? When you use a drug once a year, it's hard to, to do that. And I, I always give kudos and congrats to community oncologists. I admire them. They take care of so, so many different tumor types. It's so hard to develop expertise in a drug that you give only for one tumor type and you may see patients uh, less commonly. So it requires communication and of course, assistance and, and, and coordination sometimes with people who have given the drug with more experience to optimize the delivery for the patient and materialize, implement the Pembro EV adoption in, in an optimal way. Any other data in metastatic disease uh, that was that were um, worthy? I mean, there's a lot of data, of course. I, I mean, I don't want to really for, for the authors and folks who have contributed not to undermine the data, but this podcast is focusing on practice changing, just for folks to want to know what, what we're focusing on. Any other practice changing data that you found relevant at ESMO? I agree, Tadi, and I, I I agree with you 100%. I, I recommend to the audience to look at the ESMO proceedings, great data. Another trial we, it's worth probably discussing is the Thor trial, uh, where at Euromigos, uh, during the, the competition, the Jopardy questions was, wins, uh, which trial was named after an ancient Greek god? So we well, had Of course, and, and you, I mean, you, you should have gotten this easily, like, you know, immediately. It was an instant response. So Thor, ancient Greek god. So uh, the Thor trial, uh, I had uh, the so Thor one because there was a Thor two trial. We did not talk about it. It was not practice changing with uh, oral erdafitinib in non-muscle invasive disease. Very interesting data by Dr. Jim Cato. But now we'll we'll discuss Thor one trial metastatic urothelial cancer. Two different cohorts. Cohort one was erdafitinib FGFR inhibitor. Uh, orally available uh, versus taxane in US or vinflunin in Europe. This was for patients after um, uh, immunotherapy uh, containing regimens. Many patients have already received platinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, and that trial showed an overall survival benefit with erdafitinib, FGFR inhibitor, versus taxane or vinflunin in predicted patients. And this is only for selected patient population who have a tumor with FGFR2 or FGFR3 activating mutation or fusion rearrangement. So it's very important, practice important point to send the cancer tissue for next generation sequencing, including FGFR2 and FGFR3 genes, and specifically asking commercial or academic platform if they did mutation, look for mutations and fusions rearrangements in those two genes. FGFR2 and FGFR3, how common it is, it's about 15, 1,5% of bladder cancer cases and about 30% of upper tract, kidney, pelvis, and ureter. So overall, about 20% of patients have this alteration. And in those patients, adafitinib is a great option. The optimal sequence remains to be defined. And that's where the cohort two of third trial comes to play. Cohort two was erdafitinib, the same FGFR inhibitor, versus Pembro, second line, platinum refractory disease, let's say you get gem or gem carbo, you have progression and you don't get maintenance of Elumab, you may argue you can give Pembro EV second line, uh, that's an option, or you may give EV alone, but let's say you, whatever scenario is, if you're between ERD and Pembro, what do you do? And in these selected patients with a biomarker positive uh, characteristic. And the answer was, there was no significant OS uh, uh, difference, uh, uh, ERDA and Pembro uh, no significant difference. In, in PFS, the same thing. No significant difference statistically between the two. Response rate, 40% with ERDA, 22% with PEMBRO. So almost double response rate with ERDA. But the responses with PEMBRO were much more durable. So it produced a tail of the curve. In a degree, it reminded me sometimes the mm -hmm. dilemma in kidney cancer, right? Or in melanoma, when you have a cytotoxic agent and uh, an IO. My take on it, Sadi, is if you need a response right away, high cancer burden, visceral meds, liver meds, symptomatic explosive disease, ERDA seems very attractive to control the disease. On the other side, you have a very indolent, left node only, maybe high TMB, and your patients want to avoid toxicity, you may go for PEMBRO. At the end of the day, the, the the sequence is to be defined, and I think the third trial helps us understand better the toxicity profile of these drugs, which is important, and Erdafitinib has some unique toxicities, uh, for sure, need to see ophthalmologists, get blood work, it's more complicated, and I think helps us, again, put things in context, how to sequence those agents in advanced disease. 
So in my last segment is really, I'm going to take you through a thought experiment. You have a patient that walks into your clinic today. You have all of the options available to you. We're not going to talk about access. We're not going to talk about cost because we realize that uh, this is a problem. But you have all of the options and you can give everything. A patient walks in, you know, 72-year-old, um, otherwise healthy, and has metastatic urothelial cancer. Um, today, November 2023, are you going to offer Pembro Plus Erda? Pembro Plus EV. Um, oh, plus and, EV, uh, I'm sorry. No worries, no worries. It's, uh, it's a, I think, a practical question. The short answer is yes. So if I have access to it and uh, there is no exception, like a very bad neuropathy, you know, grade two or higher or some other reason, I think the vast majority of patients uh, in my practice will get Pembro and Fortumab if they have, again, no, no like active autoimmune disease or, you know, uh, to worry and about you treat, it. And like you treat for how long when you give that? So the design, that's a great question, Sadis. The design of the EV302 uh, was to continue agents, uh, EV and Pembro. Pembro, I think, was for, if I remember correctly, for up to two years, but EV continued until progression or unacceptable toxicity. Uh, so I would follow for now the design of the EV302, and I will, I will follow that treatment duration paradigm. However, I am in active discussions with many colleagues how we can design de-escalation trials that will ask the question, how long should we give EV in those patients? Right. Do we need to give it forever, as people ask, or can we stop earlier? Unanswered question. For the moment, I'm going to follow the EV302 paradigm, yeah. and I will be very careful in adjusting EV dose a reduction, therapy breaks, if needed, based on side effects. I love the question about de-escalation, actually. I, I, I hope that you, you you know, in the next couple of years, you'll be able to educate us into which patients we can treat, you know, more is less sometimes. Um, but uh, the same token, there may be some patients that you know they will not respond for whatever reason, Maybe their genetic uh, molecular phenotype, uh, their histology. Maybe there are certain things pertaining to these patients that they may not benefit from uh, from the non chemotherapy approach. Uh, if if we if you will, are there anything that you guys are working on to try to identify a signature that might really allow you to predict who would really benefit from the non chemotherapy approach? Versus sometimes, you know, your gemsis is probably a new, then you'll do gemsis nevo. I mean, you know, I mean, there, there should be, I don't think all patients are the same. And I wonder if you guys are working on trying to have a, a more tailored approach to selecting the treatment of choice for these patients. A great question, Sadi. I, I think, as you mentioned, blank statements, 100% or 0%, are usually not uh, always realistic in, in life or in oncology. Uh, I think, uh, having said that, I, I think the vast majority of patients uh, will get Pembro EV as frontline setting. That is the standard of care right now and ideally should be the control arm in future phase three trials. In, in, in countries where EV Pembro can be accessed. That's another discussion about trial design. Uh, having said that, can there be categories of patients where EV may be challenging? Again, sometimes you may think hard to find those people are probably rare, but maybe patients with grade two or higher neuropathy, uh, patients, you know, very obese with uncontrolled diabetes with high hemoglobin A1C that were excluded from this trial, uh, or maybe patients with severe liver dysfunction. That's a discussion with the patient in these populations of patients. Uh, and it has to be taken in, into account uh, the tumor characteristics. You talk about lymph node only disease or visceral metastasis and liver meds, these are prognostically different categories. And you have to, ben to to balance carefully benefits and risks in those particular situations that we discuss, especially grade two or higher neuropathy where EV can be challenging. Uh, so it's an individualized approach, patient by patient, case by case. Um, and I think you know the, the other uh, question is how do we deal with ongoing trials that now they may have you know, exactly, a, a yeah. different experimental arm and again, I think it's individualized. It takes into account the totality of the data. I think we have an obligation to discuss with the patient level one evidence and the existing data and I try to help them cancel them 
taking into account individual patient comorbidities, performance status, organ function, toxicity profile of the drug, efficacy, and therapy burden. You know, patients ask how often do I need to come to the cancer center? Uh, and the, the other point, Sadi, I want to raise uh, before we go is the standing ovation was so amazing and re refreshing and rejuvenating and makes us want to work even harder to make it even better, right? At the same time, with the cancer centers need uh, more, I would say, long-term planning. How can create enough workforce to, to care of more patients? Patients, thankfully, live longer. We have more referrals every week. Patients live longer. It's great that they live longer. Now, how can we take care of them safely, uh, with safety, right? We need more oncologists. We need more advanced practice providers. We need more nurses. We need more pharmacists. And we need more space, more infusion rooms. And I think that's a, a whole other discussion that you and me can have. Uh, we need to do that. I like that. I like now, now, now you're speaking my language. I always think there's one element of oncology care that has nothing to do with the drugs, uh, nothing to do with science, and it's called just the logistics of healthcare delivery. Uh, now you're talking my language. I'm actually, I became, as I got older, more interested in the healthcare delivery because, you know, one thing is you get the drug, but if the drug doesn't come to the patient, who cares at the end? Petros, I can't believe it's been an hour since we started talking. This is really amazing. I can never get bored of uh, talking to you, but uh, I have two trick questions for you. One is what's your favorite book? And you can see the book right there behind me. So you don't have, you know, what your favorite book, right? You know that. You know, uh, Toxic Exposure, this yeah, is a good. <laughs> by Tadi Naphan, right? I, I, I know good the job. guy. Good job. Uh, good job. So, so that's, that's definitely a shout out. And uh, uh, I, I was talking to some uh, trainees at, during the Euromigos meeting the other day. And uh, we're talking about uh, books. And uh, one book that came in mind is called Grit, G-R-I-T. I, uh, I think. Yeah. I think Angela Duckworth may be the author. You can uh, double check me, but this is a very interesting book about resilience. And I think it's very timely as we go through this, uh, you know, uh, world and all uh, the, all the I'm pressure. Gonna read it. You can read the grit only after you finish toxic exposure. And then are you going to go on the record and finally apologize to everyone that has ever heard you claim that baklava is Greek? Because you know, this is, this is, I mean, mis misinformation is not something that we are ever, you know, I mean, you're a scientist, you believe in the data and evidence-based, you have to stop this misinformation. We can't keep misinforming people. I, I, I will quote the amazing Professor Platanias. He's a cancer director at uh, Northwest. I know him very well. He's like very he's close well. here. And I think he's very wrong as well. I mean... <laughs> So Dr. Platania is arguing that the real baklava is with walnut and uh, and not with pistachio. So I have to support the the, the fellow Greek, but I, yeah. I can tell you, Chadi, I I look forward to seeing you in person, my friend. And very and soon before, and debate in, in, in person and, and having great time as I always have great time with you. It's very possible our next time we see each other will be ASCO GU in San Francisco. The always amazing Petros Grivos, professor. Professor, since the last time I saw you, I think a couple of years ago. On the podcast, you got promoted, of course. You know, we have to know. Professor, we have to bow for the professor. I I, I am bowing to the uh, wealth <laughs> of, of data that is coming in bladder cancer. Uh, I'm bowing to my patients, to our patients and the families, and we thank them for their contributions. As Tom said, uh, Sadi, we thank the patients who go gone to all the trials. Absolutely. That's how we make progress, my friend. And thank you for, for all the important work you're doing in education and, and uh, educational mission. Thank you so much, Petros. Until next time, take care. Thank you.